Welcome, everybody. It's uh, two o'clock and welcome to the F5 and Nginx webinar. I am about to start just about now because it's two o'clock. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Osa and I have been with F5 for six years. Now, about a year ago, 10 months ago, we purchased Nginx. Now, I made the decision to start working with Nginx instead, to specialize in Nginx. And there's a reason for that. And one of the reasons being that I meet a lot of customers every, every year. Every year, I do about 200 meetings where I meet customers in all different sorts of verticals. And what I'm seeing on the market now is like 95% of the applications that are being developed today are being developed within microservices, within microservices. So what I'm working with today is Nginx. So just a little bit of, of a history. Now, probably everyone in this call, every single one of you, just like me, before eight o'clock, you probably used several of our platforms. You probably used F5 and you probably used Nginx as well. Nginx is one of the biggest ways of taking care of microservices. And that is the reason why we purchased Nginx. They are, I would say, the king in this market. If you look at Uber, if you look at uh, Instagram, if you look at, uh, uh, well, let's take another one, Netflix. Anyone of you watches Netflix? They're built up on Nginx. So they are the king of this market. Now, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the history of Nginx. Like 2002, we had Igor that worked at Rambler who actually had a problem. So Nginx is built on a problem, or out of a problem, the C10K problem where Apache couldn't handle more than 10,000 concurrent users. So he wrote Nginx. He open sourced it. Now, this is the cool thing. In a year, we had 10,000 users. After two years, there were over 100,000 users. Now, after three years, there are over a million users. And today, more than 400 million sites run Nginx. So there's got to be something good about it. Now, F5 has always been brilliant with monolithic and modern applications. But when you're looking at the new world with microservices, where everything has to be really fast and agile, Nginx is the king. We are so small, you can actually live inside a, a container. You spin it up in seconds. So that's why we purchased Nginx, to be able to handle all the new applications being developed in microservices. Now, the challenges that we see as a company, F5 and Nginx, but I also bring, want to bring in the challenges that I see with the customers, with the 200 meetings that I, that I do. Now, when you and me go out to a website, we expect speed, right? When I go to Google or when I go to Facebook or Netflix or Uber, I expect it to be fast. If I want to go and shop something, I expect it to be fast. If I go and do my bank errands or credit card errands, I want it to be safe and secure. Now, these are the expectations that you and me have as a customer, but now, this is hard because developing the applications, that's only half the problem. The other half for you as a company is actually delivering this application fast with speed and doing it in an agile way. And business agility, that's also hard. I see a lot of companies today when I meet them, they are they're locking the applications into the underlying infrastructure. So it's hard to move them from different platforms. It's hard to move them from on-prem up to the cloud and from one cloud to another because you're tying the application in 
to the underlying infrastructure. Like one, once upon a time, we had mainframe. Mainframe only worked on mainframe. Uh, Windows didn't work on Linux. Solaris only work on Sun and so on. And, and this is something that I see that my customers, in order to be able to be agile, they want to move away from this. And that's pretty hard now. The digital ROI, that's a, another thing. Today, I mean, I meet customers and they, they're spinning up applications here and there, but there's, there's no control. I mean, you have, you have uh, applications and instances spin, spun up in the cloud, but you have no control. You have no visibility. And there's instances up there running and that is costing money. I have a, 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 actually an example of a customer, one of the biggest websites or, or web, uh, how should I say, web travel agencies in Europe that I've been work with, working with, they had over a hundred different travel websites. Now they made a decision, we are going to go cloud, we're going to move everything up in Azure. Now I think what he told me, they burned the whole year's IT budget on a few months because you have a lot of scrapers you have a lot of traffic API calls and stuff a lot of things that cost money and moving it up all to one cloud they didn't get control over the costs and they burnt the whole IT budget in, in, in just you know a couple of months they had to bring it all back and this is the other thing it was hard to bring it all back because they were tied into the underlying infrastructure. They were using the underlying infrastructure up there in the cloud. And that did not even have all the security that they needed. So I think you have to be more, more agile and look at the cost and make sure that you have visibility all the way from the code, the actual application, all the way to your customers. Now, I mentioned that I do around 200 meetings a year, and this is what I see, infrastructure lock-in. You're tied into the underlying infrastructures. That's one of the things that I see. So it's hard to move from on-prem up to the cloud and to move between different clouds. Extremely hard. If you wanna move things back, that's also very expensive. You have no control over the cost. Another thing that I see is when I meet customers, they're working in silos. You have the network teams and the security guys that I've been meeting a lot the past six years. Now they have uh, security rules, they have uh, uh, regulations, they have uh, different sets and that's hard when you're working with the developers. Because when I meet developers, what do the developers want? They want speed. All they want is to get the application out there fast, up in the cloud, on-prem, anywhere, but they want speed. They don't have time to sit and wait for the security or the network guys. They just see them as a threat, as a hinder in order for them to get the applications out there. So this is a bottleneck for the developers. And this is what I see a lot. It prevents agility and, and, and collaboration between the roles. And now this is something that I find very interesting and the, something that's very close to me. Tool sprawl. Now, what does that mean? I also mentioned digital ROI. What's happening on the market now? With the microservices, the containers, and the multi-cloud journey that customers are on, what, ha what is happening with the market? If you, if you look at the market, you have products and companies exploding. Every day there's a new company with a new perfect solution. And what is happening here is the companies, the developers, they use the solutions. They use some open source there. They use a tool there. They use a solution here. Now, what is happening now? If you look at it long term, tool sprawl. I'm going to give you an example. Now, six years ago, I met with a head of architects at the Swedish police. And I asked the Swedish police, okay, so what is your three to five year plan? Where do you wanna be in three to five years plan? Now the head of architect, he told me now, our strategy that we set 10 years ago was to buy best of breed of everything. And I said, how, what? that's interesting. What do you mean? Well, he said, we bought best of breed of everything. 
And he actually whiteboarded kind of what I'm showing here to you now. So if you're looking at the, the actual application here on your left side, the actual code, and you have the customer on the right side, in order for the customer to actually reach the application, you have several different, I say proxy jumps or solutions or platforms or products. You have the CDN, you have DDoS protection, you have DNS, application security, load balancing. And when I had talked to the Swedish police, the ed our architects there, they have several load balancers. They have several firewalls. They have several solutions for security. IPSs, intrusion detection, data leakage prevention. And another big problem here was SSL, because everything went through encrypted tunnels. So that was another issue, but they have several different solutions. And when I asked the Swedish police, so what was the problem here for you? He said, the biggest problem for us was the cost. So I asked, what was the biggest cost for you then? He said, the biggest cost for us was integration. Making all of the best of breed solutions to talk to each other was one of our biggest costs. But then also latency was another problem. The latency and the proxy jumps because they have to go through all of these different solutions. And this is the problem that I see with every single customer that I meet today. The more solutions you have, the bigger problem you have, and the slower it is for you. Time to market is extremely important. You have to be out there fast. You have to be first. And that's hard if you're doing it with the tool sprawl that a lot of customers have today. I even have put, this is a UK bank, a, a big UK bank, and we have actually put their environment, their IT infrastructure in a PowerPoint. So if you look here, this is the way it looked like. And now when I show this PowerPoint to customers, they recognize themselves. So if you're looking at the customer here on the right side, over here is the customer. Now, in order for the customer to be able to look at your bank statement, to look at the actual application, this is the journey that you have to take. And in this case, maybe you will recognize them yourself. In this case, they had a CDN, they had Akamai, CloudFront and Varnish. They had DNS, they had DNS in the cloud with Akamai. They also had DDoS protection. This is a lot of cases where I see you had DDoS protection up in the cloud and you also have a DDoS protection on-prem. But every single jump here is adding latency, it's adding complexity. Load balancing. Now they had layer seven and layer four load balancing. But as you can see here, it's one, two, three, four different platforms. API gateway. Now, that's, this is something that is exploding right now. And why is that? It's because applications need to talk to each other, both internally and externally. And you need a platform in order to be able to do this in a controlled way and also add security. So you need an API gateway. Now, they chose three different platforms for this. And they also had load balancing again. And now you look at the environment. I mean, I think every single company, especially banks that I meet today, they have their monolithic applications, but they're struggling with automation. You need to automate the monolithic applications as well because you need speed. What did Elon Musk say? If you use people in production, you will move at people's speed. Now, companies today, they cannot afford to move at people's speed. You need to automate every step of the way in order for it to be fast and in order for it to be secure as well. You don't want any manual tampering here in between. And what all of the, as we talked about in the beginning, what you're also building up here in parallel is an environment with microservices, with containers. And this is where the market is exploding. You have so many different, uh, how should I say, products here in order to solve solutions. 
ingress controllers, API gateways, and so on. Now, with this particular bank, as you can see here, they had several application uh, uh, platforms, web servers, application servers, and so on. They were struggling with latency, with visibility. So what they did was they consolidated. So at the front door, at the gate of the castle, at the gate of the bank, they put F5. F5 as DDoS protection, DNS, also web application firewall. They didn't have a staff enough to look at the security rules. They wanted a company who have men and women that eat, live, and breathe security to help them with their security for their web applications. Also, they use Nginx as a CDN. Why is because of cost to get control over the cost and to lower the costs and to consolidate. Now, here at the front gate, you consolidated the, the front door load balancing with F5, where F5 took care of load balancing, local and global. We did SSL decryption, encryption, and we did SSL orchestration, advanced load balancing, advanced web application firewall and we also could make the decision who will access what from what platform so we did single sign on with with the apm in in the f5 ddos protection cgnat and so on now close to the application we wanted to give the developers the speed that they wanted we wanted to give the developers the control that they wanted we wanted to give them speed so here they chose to consolidate close to the application with nginx so they used nginx plus because they wanted support they used nginx plus for advanced load balancing as a reverse proxy as an api gateway as an ingress controller and the plan is also to use it as a per application web application firewall now this is was unto and and uh, uh, the next speaker is going to talk martin's going to talk a little bit more about i just wanted to end saying one or two things so here you have a fully automated platform that will help you with the cicd the continuous integration and continuous development platform so i mean if you have release cycles with that will last you from six to 12 months, you can speed these things up. I mean, look at Amazon. They have release cycles every 13 seconds. Now you need to automate this. So you have one platform here that's best for the application developers with Nginx. You still need the platform where you have high security. You need a lot of security rules. And this is better for the NetOps and the SecOps. So you have two platforms. Now, if you look at the advantages of this, as a bank told me, I have 15 big customers that came with me to Seattle when we had the Aspire who could meet with the management at F5. Now, when we told them about our strategy where you have one platform for the microservices, that will interact with the platform that we have for F5. So here you have the ability to manage and control everything with Big IQ. Here you have the platform to manage and control everything with Nginx controller. And you have visibility with Beacon. Now, when I told the bank this, he said that for us, this is Nirvana. And when I asked the bank, so why? Why is this so good for you? Because he said that when we have a problem, when we have a problem with our bank application, it can sometimes take us hours. It can take us weeks. And it can sometimes take us months before we've solved the problem because we have so many different platforms going from code to customer. We don't even know where to start looking. And for us to have one platform for the microservices and containers, another platform here for the monolithic or modern applications, it would be the dream. And to have complete visibility from code to customer with one platform, it's Nirvana. 
Now, Martin's going to continue to give you a little bit more on automation. And this was all for me. Thank you very much. And over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Asa, for uh, the introduction to this one. Thank I'm you. just going to share my slides. Let me see if it's going, working fine. Okay, hopefully you see them, yeah? Yes. Fine, fine, perfect, thank you. So I got a short slot on this webinar today to give you an introduction to F5 automation approach, and I will touch both Nginx and uh, Big IP product. I, in my slides, in my presentation, I will be more focusing on Big IP because then my colleague Antun is going to speak more in more details about Nginx part. So what automation approach should you choose? It really depends what kind of person or what kind of uh, organization you work for, whether you are more GUI based or you are API based, your approach is API. So we have solutions for both of you. If you are more GUI based, then we propose using our our solution using Big IQ or Nginx controller. We have spent a lot of uh, time, lots of development the last couple of uh, months in bringing both platforms and changing them from centralized management to application centric management approach. What does it mean? In traditional centralized management, you as application owner, you want to make some change in your application. Maybe you want to deploy application in development test or production, or you want to apply some configuration change. So in classical uh, approach using centralized management approach, you will just submit ticket using a ticketing system to your colleague from network operation or security operation, and they are going to log into a centralized management system, either Big IQ or Nginx controller, and they are going to implement a change for you. And then feedback about the change was executed that you can test it yourself. The same applies for some troubleshooting approach. So if you would like to change if your application is working properly, uh, you will need to ask your colleague from network operation or security operation to check it for you because maybe you have some doubts that something is not okay. With our application centric approach of using Big IQ and Nginx controller, Nginx controller 3.0, you as application owner, you are getting directly access to a dashboard, to a customized dashboard where you can implement the change yourself if it's allowed in your profile. So you can benefit from pre-configured configuration templates that were prepared by your network operation and security operation colleague. And you can use a, lab a library of those templates to implement the change yourself. As well, you can log into the dashboard to the portal and you can check real time how is your application services looks like. In next, Couple of slides I'm going to show you what is the feeling of this tool for Big IQ. You will see my colleague Antun then will be showing you something about the Nginx controller. So on my slides, I'm just focusing on Big IQ to save the time. So this is a typical view when you as application owner who prefers using the GUI, you will log into the Big IQ. This is a typical uh, view that you will get. You will see your applications, depending on your profile, only specific applications might be displayed. And then you immediately see that here, application number 18, something is going wrong. So you will just click on it and it brings you to another view. Here we have a user called Paula that she is checking her application number 18. Something is not okay. Why it is not okay? Because some thresholds that were predefined for health monitoring are showing some alarms. So uh, transaction rate, success rate is uh, exceeding some threshold. Round trip time on server side is exceeding also some threshold. When Pavla will be utilizing this dashboard, she will have direct view about some security policies that are applied. And this is the most important part here in the middle. Uh, this menu is, this is the dynamic page and it depends where Pavla will click, whether the application itself, the client side of the connection 
server side of the connection or the environment itself, then Paula will get some specific dashboards and configuration uh, management menu depends on her profile, of course. What I mentioned before is that uh, those centralized management platforms that were evolved to application-centric management systems allows to, for cooperation between security operation, network operation, operations, and the application developers. It works in the way that both SecOps and NetOps using the traditional GUI approach, which they are used to use already today, they will be able to predefine some templates, application templates, maybe HTTP profile, or security templates like SSL offload profile, web application firewall, etc. Once those templates are ready, they are able to publish those templates that application owner, maybe a developer of the application, can access those templates and use them in their development, test, and production environments. And then they are able to deploy the application services as needed, as was prepared by their, by their colleague from security and <clears throat> network operations. What if you are another type of person? We showed you quickly about GUI-driven management. What if you are API-driven management person? <clears throat> or if simply you would like to integrate the solution to your existing or to your new automation and orchestration pipeline using API. We have also a solution for you in F5. Here is an overview of F5 automation toolchain. It starts from initial bootstrap of the system. So from the moment you will just uh, boot the instance of the system either on hardware, in your private cloud or in public cloud. And for that, we have a support so-called cloud templates. So you don't need to spend uh, lots of time by finding yourself how to configure high available pair of the system in Google Cloud, for example. You will just check the, the template which is prepared for you. And here I'm showing two links, GitHub F5 Networks and GitHub F5 Dev Central. Uh, F5 Networks is the collection of F5 developed and fully supported templates that you might use. And F5 Dev Central instead is the community driven templates that you can use as well. But for those then no formal support is provided. So one bootstrap is done. So you have booted your uh, instance of, this, of the solution. You typically need to onboard the system. What onboarding means? Onboarding is the licensing, the solution, uh, configuring some resources that you want to use, configuring networking, VLANs, IP addresses, uh, configuring some users, etc. Basically to bring the system up to the level that you can start using it. For onboarding, we have something de called declarative onboarding, which is the JSON-based template for declarative configuration of the system. I will speak a bit more details on the next slide. Then for configuration of application services on the system, we have something similar. We have something called application services tree proxy, which is also JSON based <clears throat> form that you can use in declarative configuration of the application services. And then once the system is booted, it's configured, including the application services on, you need a solution which will provide you the telemetry data to see how your applications are working, how they are behaving. For that one, we have something called telemetry streaming extension, which I will also have single slide later. So when we speak about declarative onboarding, what does it mean? Declarative onboarding is JSON template, which allows you to use one single declarative API one single declarative call to provision several parameters on the system. So to license it, to configure the IP addresses, VLAN, NTP server, DNS, etc., etc. Uh, normally, without this uh, API, you need to be the expert on big IP. You need to know that firstly, you need to license it, then you need to create some resources on it, then you need to create VLAN, then self IP, etc., etc. 
With this template, you don't need to be a subject matter expert on Big IP. You just simply log into the portal, you download the template you would, which you would like to use, for example, for HA pair of Big IPs, and you just modify the parameters as you would like to use it, and with one single REST API call, you will onboard the system. To be easier, let's just have a look at the simple declaration. Here is the declaration from my lab that I was just using. So with this JSON, I just configure the host name of the system. I license the system. I provision the firewall resource. I configure the VLANs and the IP addresses. And at the end, I, set, I define the default route for my system. And this simple JSON template, one single post this JSON file, this JSON template to this URI, and that's it. Here I have a link for you where you can find more information about declarative onboarding, including lots and lots of examples of those templates that are ready to use for you. As I mentioned before, once the system is onboarded, you need to configure the application services. And the application services consist from defining the protocol profile, SSL profile, uh, set application servers, pool, load balancing algorithm, etc., etc. Again, it's all possible of doing it by a, some standard single REST API, but you need to be subject matter expert. You need to know what to do first and how they relate to each other. With this AS3 API, application services three declarative API, you just use one single template without knowing the order of the configuration that you need to do. And again, to be easy, one simple example here. So in this template, we are configuring one HTTP server, we are defining the pool, health monitor, and we specify in which configuration partition. And again, just submit this template to this URI by using post, and that's it, configuration is done. And here I include again link for you for the documentation. You can download the latest RPM from there. And really you have tons and tons of templates that you can start using already today. So without knowing the specifics of big IP technology, you can start using it. Telemetry streaming extension, it's pretty similar. It's declarative JSON uh, configuration of telemetry information of statistics collection. So with one single template, you will just specify what statistics you would like to get, point number one, and then on, configur on configurable time period, like example, six, every 60 seconds, Big IP will start streaming those telemetry data to the destination of your choice. And we support variety of third party products like Kafka, HTTP, pure HTTP streaming here as displayed on the slide. And again, the link for you where you can consult more details. So we described briefly what solution we have for you in automation area, whether you are GUI based person, whether you are API based person. What if your organization requires using both of them? And that's typically the case because this typically represents a network operation and security operation person. This is the way how they are using, how they are used to configure the devices already today, the services already today. And this is the way how developers would like to use the applications, application services. And this is also the way or how to integrate them to your automation and orchestration ecosystem. So, no problem, we have solution for this use case as well. And that's the same answer, using Big IQ and Nginx controller. On one hand, it provides the traditional GUI-based persons like security operation and networking operation, GUI-based approach to configure the service catalogs, the templates, security templates and application templates. And on the other hand, it provides the REST API that developers of the application or those automation tools can consume predefined templates and dynamically provision the service uh, services configuration independent where those services are hosted, whether in public cloud, private cloud, or on-premise hardware or virtual editions. That's concluding my short time slot for today about automation introduction, and I give the word to Antun.
Before we continue, Philip Glass speaking, hello everybody. Uh, let me just uh, highlight that there is a Q&A button uh, at the bottom part of your Zoom window. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask and we'll answer all your questions uh, at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Antonio, you're muted. Yeah, there we go. So guys, um, let's let's change gears a little bit. Um, I also highlighted how Nginx um, and F5 came to be as as, as a team. Um, I joined from the Nginx side, uh, and it's been my privilege ever since to to be part of uh, part of the the F5 team. So you know, with that, you know, I was thinking of giving you uh, a quick introduction into you know Nginx from from what we see, what we, where we come from and what f5 has brought from from a vision perspective and and how you know especially in light of automation um <clears throat> always you know comes together so really quickly nginx is hopefully you know this it's free um, it's an open source project and it is probably and i hope you know this uh, known to be the one of the highest performing http servers um, currently um, available it's also reverse proxy and you know, there's additional capabilities like IMAP and POP3 as well for that. Um, we're really known for performance, stability, a very rich feature set, simple configuration and, and low resource consumption. And the low resource consumption ties very well in with the high performance because if you manage your resources carefully, you're able to deliver high performance on you know, a limited amount of resources. So our founder, the guy who wrote it, Igor, he said, I wrote, I wrote this and uh, I really, I wanted people to use it. So that's why I made it open source. And from there on, it took off, you know, quite a few big names using us and we're you know, very humble and very proud for that. So as I also said, 400 million sites run Nginx. Um, depends a bit on the metrics, how you look at it, but about 66% of the top 10,000, 58% of the top 100,000. And last that we know, 40% of all AWS services actually runs on Nginx. So what makes Nginx so fast then um, is really the question. And that is Igor's decision to really start off from the scratch with an event-driven architecture, which you see here on the on screen. So you see basically a master process that does all of the, the housekeeping, it loads conflicts, it loads states, it manages the logs, it loads the modules, and all of the work is handed off to, well, you know, just by virtue of the name, by workers. Workers handle traffic, proxy traffic going to upstreams, handle traffic going to application servers, handle static files in case you use it as a web server, um, manages the cache and so on. Um, and the workers are very flexible, very scalable. Uh, and you see that, you know, depending on the circumstances, you're able to very easily adjust the number of workers to the amount of hardware or virtual hardware that you actually have deployed with your environments. Um, that all coupled to a, a footprint of not even two megabytes makes it for a very, very fast web server. Um, as you may imagine, um, we deliver, you know, we keep on de developing Nginx open source. And so what you see is that we have a very, very fast um, release cycle where we publish every, every month about so, so about 10 times a year, we publish new features. 
And of course, that is not a really good fit for, for most customers because that would imply that you'd have to update, I don't know, 10 times a year to keep up. So in addition to that, we also have a, a stable release, which we, which we aim to update only once a year. So that's happening in April. And with the exception of um, critical bug fixes, that's it. So for Nginx Plus, our commercial version, we have a similar model. Um, however, we can't ask from you know, customers that they update you know, 10, 12 times a year. So we've aligned on about three releases per year. So September aligns with the Nginx conference. December is another major feature drop. And in April, that's when we cut over from Nginx mainline to the next version. That one is actually coming up really soon. So be on the lookout for Nginx R1.19 very soon. So one of the key things that makes Nginx um, like powerful is the fact that it's designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that is delivering HTTP or TCP transactions. However, it was also built with modularity in mind. And so Nginx is equipped with, or you can, you can configure Nginx to run with lots of modules. And there's a nice little graph I made for you. Um, Say, so, you know, GYP is you know, a very popular module. Uh, NJS, the Nginx JavaScript, allowing you to run JavaScript inside the data path is really, is, is a lot used. Lua is used a lot um, and so on. And of course you see the interesting one here, Prometheus for metrics in a Kubernetes environment, uh, open tracing for well, tracing in, uh, in, in Jaeger environments, in, in light of service mesh and so on. So you see a lot of, you know, very stable capabilities, very modern capabilities uh, covering a, a broad aspect of, of works. So when you generally look at how the features are described, and this is this is especially the where it comes to the difference between Nginx open source and Nginx Plus as a commercial product, is that we, we aim to make everything very, very transparent. So there is probably nothing you cannot get to work in open source, everything will just work. There are the modules that you can use, there is the compression that you can use. You can build your entire website, including the, the caching and the embed, embedded script languages, all in open source without having to resort to some commercial products. And, and to us, that is, that is very key. We want you to have a, a functional product that doesn't limit you in, in any way. It's, it's not supposed to be crippleware. So on the other hand, we have you know, a number of paying customers and they typically are in the enter enterprise space. So what they request is, for instance, more advanced load balancing because they have, I don't know, instead of one or two backends, they may have 10 or 20 requiring, each requiring different kind of load balancing algorithms. They typically want uh, active health checks. Um, they want some more advanced analytics. If they run a, a CDN, they typically want the ability to do cache purging and so on. And they really appreciate an API that exposes the metrics. And you know, the converse is true, of course, as well. Some customers just like a pretty dashboard. So you know, that is by and large where Nginx Plus and Nginx Open Source differ. So you, we make sure that you can get your site or your application up and running and secured with open source. If you, if you appreciate the enterprise features, then, then we've got you covered as well. So another important aspect, you know, especially taking in, in mind the, uh, the release cycles that we have is, of course, we are the owners and the authors of Nginx. So that means that when, when a vulnerability is reported, it typically gets reported to us. And we're helping our, our paying customers with that, in fact. So here's the last CVE that Nginx dealt with. And as you can see, that one was fixed for open source on August 13th. And that is, of course, the release date of the CVE. And our paying customers actually 
got that fix on August 6th. So that gives our paying customers a little bit of a time advantage into mitigating the CVE before it's actually getting released. We're hoping to help them with that. So another couple of key features that's uh, related to Nginx Plus, our commercial product, is the ability to do seamless configuration reloads. And that works you know, pretty straightforward. So we saw that event-driven architecture with the master and the workers. Um, once you give Nginx Plus a signal, um, it will spin up new workers. And only when the new workers have started up and started handling traffic, only then old workers will be retired. Once that's done, you ultimately get to your new state where all you have is new workers with a new configuration. And this allows us to do hitless configuration changes. So you don't have to be afraid that you will ever lose a transaction or a paying customer. And in effect, as far as we, you know, as far as the scope of Nginx, you could do this in production during peak hours. It, we've, we've seen customers do it all the time. We have a similar strategy for upgrading Nginx binaries or any of the binaries that are related to, to Nginx. So as you know, um, Nginx doesn't have its own SSL libraries. We, we typically use OpenSSL. And if you need to update those, update those, then we follow a similar path. So you give a signal to the master and that master then duplicates itself, reloading itself from disk and also reloading the new, new workers from disk with all the libraries that, that are related to it. Um, once you've verified that everything is up and running, you can actually terminate the old master in its, in its own time. And this again is a mechanism that helps you deliver you know, your application securely without downtime, which is a key advantage of, of using Nginx Plus. A little bit more requirement that, cost, that our customers have is, for instance, the ability to build a cluster. So we allow, we help you build clusters by using Keep Alive D. So Keep Alive D comes from our repository. You can install it, comes configured, you install templates, and if you use it, you have a floating IP that just is able to, well, normally it would sit on the master, and in case of a failover, it would migrate to the backup. Very simple, very straightforward. Uh, another typical requirement for a, for a cluster is of course to have a, a, a consistent configuration across, across the cluster. And we appreciate that there's many ways to do it. And for those customers who have no other ways of doing it, we provide with configuration synchronization scripts that allow you to sync the configuration across all of your clusters. That's, that's really helpful. And most importantly, probably, um, I think is, is the ability to synchronize states across the cluster. Um, if you think about you know, uh, the state of a session that you learn from a cookie, uh, rate limits that you enforce across uh, the cluster, and thirdly, our key value store that's built into Nginx Plus. Setting up state sync, make sure that all of the nodes in the cluster have the same and common view. And that means that you, you have achieved high availability. So moving on a little bit into the automation space. Of course, we have a role of Ransible. And in fact, it is extremely, extremely simple. Just define the role said, you know, in this case, I'm deploying Nginx Plus. So I set the type to plus, I pick a particular version, I specify my license and I hope you don't, uh, don't mind that I blacked out my real license number, install that, push a configuration to it and, and off you go. That's, that's pretty much what, what you need to do to be up and running with, with Nginx Plus from, a, from an Ansible perspective. Um, so, let me just break out and just show you a little bit of the capabilities that we have from that end. So, um, there. 
So we talked about briefly about that API. So if you enable that in Nginx, this, this is what you get. You get something that you can query with your browser or with your Chrome client. Um, and you can inspect whatever's in there. So getting to know this is of course a bit tedious. So fair enough, we provide you with a full Swagger file that's actually delivered with, with the REST API. So if you wanted to get, get some information on, let's say, HTTP locations, this is how you do it. You, know, you can view it, you can set some parameters, and you can test it. You see a good example of how to build this. You know, this gets you up and running with, with the API uh, really quickly. So that, that's the API. So what about metrics then? Um, so for the metrics, um, we provide a, a dashboard. So this is the dashboard that's fully configured from, uh, from demo.nginx.com. And you see lots of alerts and you see lots of tabs providing all kinds of visibility. But I've also provided a simple application. You might know it, Jewshop, the OWASP vulnerable website. That's modern. So let's have a look at the configuration here. So you can see actually that this is pretty much it. There's a, I've defined an upstream. I've defined a zone for the upstream. I've defined a server with a status zone for the server. Um, and I've defined some locations. And so what you can see is I've, I'm using two locations and they point, in fact, they point to the same backend. And the only reason that I do this is because I now am able to monitor specifically the statistics for this particular endpoint. So let's go and have a look at, at how that dashboard looks. So here we are, you know, again, an overview of, of everything that's going on. And this is on my local machine, so it's not doing much. Um, you can see that, you know, got 26 hands checks, zero of them failed, eight session reuses, wonderful. I'm very happy about that. Um, HTTP zones, this is, this is actually where the, the server zones are in. So, um, remember that was, that was this one. So there's one for port 80. And as you can see below, there's one for port 443 as well. And, you know, on that level, you get immediate visibility of everything that's going on. So this one has served 163 200s and port 443 hasn't you know, served anything because well, I reset the counters on that one. Similar for the location. So I told you that I, I defined that main zone and you can see the statistics here. So broken down by response codes and I've also got the visibility for this specific endpoint in the application. Um, so if you go and click around in the, in the application, a little bit, let's go and file a complaint, customer, uh, maybe not. I'm not good at filing complaints. I think we should see uh, some metrics actually. And as you can see, port 80, it increased. On the general view, it increased. And, you know, yeah, a, lot, a number of transactions going on. We get a similar view, of course, for the, for the upstreams. And you saw that, you know, I've defined one backend. And you can see that one is up, zero failing, one, none are draining and none are down. That, you know, there's one backend, that's it. And you can see again, those 186, 200 responses. <clears throat> you also get, you know, with a dashboard and Nginx plus API, you get a good visibility of the shared zones that you have configured. So all of these memory objects that you, you use in the configuration, they get reported here in the shared zones and you can actually see how much memory you're using. And so the whole goal of being performant is by managing your resources carefully. And memory is one of those expensive uh, items 
to manage and really carefully. So, you know, we give you a good view of, of how much of those resources you're, you're using. The server is not doing much, so I didn't configure much memory. So, but still, you know, a good amount of memory is consumed of what I allocated. Likewise, when we touched on this, I, I built a cluster. So here's the cluster status. This means that there is one other node available. And I created a key value store that is synced across the cluster, but it doesn't hold any records. Um, so let me go and see if there's any questions. Mm. There's one open. Yeah, so the question is, seamless reloads are still only an Nginx Plus feature? Um, yes, they are. Um, that is, that's the choice that we've made. Um, so yeah. So I hope you're enjoying Envoy. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Um, moving on. So Nginx itself is, is not the be all and end all of, 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 of the world, I guess. It, you know, a reverse proxy is only so much. So there is a lot of applications built on Nginx and it's, it's used in a lot of environments. Um, one of the main areas would be, for instance, Kubernetes. Um, and so, you know, the, the traditional, the default uh, ingress controller on Kubernetes was actually built on, on top of Nginx, the Nginx open source. Um, like we do with, you know, the community versions, we also deliver our own uh, Kubernetes ingress controller. And the whole point of that being, you know, to serve our, our, our enterprise customers well. And so <clears throat> what we've built is we've built a solution that allows you to modularly use um, F5 in the traditional uh, way, couple that to Kubernetes, use that for, um, use the Nginx ingress controller with it and allow you to seamlessly scale the Kubernetes cluster. So if you add a node, if you add a worker node and you know, there's another ingress pod uh, appearing, the big IP will automatically discover it and publish it. And the Nginx ingress controller is, is able to deliver all of your application routing within Kubernetes. That's getting quite a lot of traction and we're having a lot of, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of success with that actually. So another use case that we see is, is Nginx in, Nginx Plus in, in clouds, because I think that quite a few companies, and, and this, is, this is what I see typically, is they have some applications in Google, they have some applications in Azure or AWS, some on-prem, uh, some in containers, some in Docker, um, a variety of environments. And so what is really helpful in that area is that if you have multiple clouds, then either you can relearn and redeploy and rebuild all of your environments, you know, based on, on the native load balancer and its capabilities, or if you abstract that away with by using Nginx as a very thin, small, high performance uh, load balancer, you get to enjoy the benefits of Nginx in all of your clouds. So you have the same capabilities available, the same metrics available, the same performance available. And you know, it, it just gives you a lot less hassle. You can use all of the, the, the clustering tools that, that we talked briefly on. Um, so yeah, um, this, is, this is something that we see happening a lot. However, you know, just looking at Nginx, just looking at the API, just looking at Ansible, um, this, really still doesn't, you know, help large enterprises to address, um, you know, a consistent build out of, of their application environment and being able to publish that. 
and let alone across multiple clouds. So that is actually where the Nginx controller comes in. So Nginx controller takes a similar role to what Big IQ does for, for F5. And that it manages, configures, monitors, tunes, Nginx plus instances. And it's a very modular, very lightweight coupling, so you can run them on-prem or in whatever cloud that you happen to, to use. So we don't care if it's in AWS or Azure or GCP or on-prem, as long as we can connect to it, we're fine. And the whole idea behind that is to just with, as with Big IQ, to make sure that application publishing is seen as something that's, you know, done by various teams. There's, there's the DevOps guys, there's the security teams, there's the application developers, all of them take a part in uh, delivering an application. So let's, let's jump into Nginx controller for a bit. There we go. So what you can see is I spun up an Nginx controller for you. Which is completely, completely empty. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get out of here and register it. So that that has been taken care of. That's nice. Let's go. Um, well, let's forget about that one. So this one is running and what you'll see it doing is that it, it will actually start registering. That's done. And the whole idea about controller is, is again, to provide an application centric view of, of the landscape, in this case for Nginx. And so with that, there is a complete API that's available to you. Just as you saw with, um, with the Swagger file for Nginx itself, we have this one available and as long as you go, let's go and do a simple one. Let's go. Well, where is it? Let's go get the global settings, for instance. You see that we define a path, a method, a bunch of responses. We give an example of a 200, what it should look like, etc. So you have, you know, this is immediately gets you started on the path to delivering you know, automation with controller. So let's go see if my instance has been registered. And well, there it is. So let's go and deploy a couple of environments. Um, and off we go. So the, the, the central theme of, of publishing applications with controller is, is about being app-centric, right? So what we're looking at is, is environments. Um, and you can see, there we go, they're all configured. In case you wanted to look at the um, Playbook, it's really simple. Uh, 
here we go. I'm using a, a login statement and simple login and ultimately this is the JSON object that I submit. And I looped that a couple of times, so I created dev, test, acceptance, and prod. That's really all there is. So, of course, you could create your own environments, and that, you know, um, let's call this one on prod. And I'm gonna skip over the display names and, and whatever. And the interesting thing is that you can actually already see here the API request as well. So. Let's say if I added a type, so this one would be in AWS, see instantly the tag being updated. And that means that all you need to do is copy paste this and use that in, in your environment for, for your automation. It's really meant to help you automate uh, in a consistent fashion. So I am going to cancel this because I have no need for another environment. So let's, let's, go do some GUI stuff because, you know, sometimes you just want to use uh, a, web, uh, a web for a user, for user interface. So here's my environment. And interestingly, I get, you know, statistics all of a sudden, even though I don't have an application yet. So let's go and begin by creating a gateway. So this one will, will be JS Def gateway. Um, I'm going to put that one in the development environment. I'm going to go next. I'm going to put that on my first load balancer. I'm going to give it an entry point. So shop the Anton Hardware and Nginx. I could optionally select match methods and, and all kinds of things. I could override TLS settings. Let's store even the HTTP methods to use, buffer sizes, all kinds of things that are relevant to a logical entry point. And here again is that that API, that or that JSON object that you can later on submit if you wanted to do this from from an automation perspective. Let's go and submit it. Um, and let's go and create an app. The app will be juice shop. And I'm going to put that in my development environment. And then I am going to create my first component. Yeah, let's go and have an error log with the defaults and put that on this gateway. You see, this is where the gateway comes back. So every object that you create, you create it in a certain environment. And because you assign your users rights based on the environment as the, as the, the component, that means that if you assign your developers a particular load balancing that's allowed only to be used in dev, well, then fair enough, you can do so. And you can make it really, really smooth and really workable. So add, add a URI, let's go slash. Be done with it. I'm not gonna filter on methods. It's not so relevant yet. Um, and add Oops. 168, 423. And it's running on 3000, so there we go. You see, there's, there's lots of stuff that I don't configure. They're all sensible defaults. Done. That's the upstream. Um, let me go and enable monitoring because I, I do like to see some health checks actually on this application. Default state, healthy, sounds good to me.
Um, there's lots more, but let me, you know, just for completion. Yeah, here's again, here's a fully filled out JSON. So if you don't know how to build that JSON, build it in the UI, copy paste it, and off you go. See, there's an error. So that says that the error creating component, no valid server name found in URI HTTP 192. So there's probably a typo there. So let's go and edit it. Oh, yep. There we go. So you see, I get instant feedback on what I'm doing, everything that I put in is validated. It really makes sure that you're not pushing anything that's you know potentially harmful. You can, there's lots of stuff that you can do that's harmful with good configurations anyway. So let's just you know, validate things before we submit it. So, you know, let's take a step back, look at the environment. Created it in the development environment getting those metrics. And I can see that I have the, this first app. And that first app has a component that's here. And you see that the screen doesn't change much, did it? So let's go and create some traffic. This one can go, this one can go. Um, gotta go and check. Did I set it up correctly? Yep, I think so. And there we go, back in the application again. So now let's, let's go and, I don't know, click around a little bit, generate some traffic. Probably I need to log out and log in. Let's see. Yeah, I am someone at Gmail. My very insecure password. I'm going to replace that with another one. Yeah, there we go. Now I can order stuff. That seems interesting as well. Let's go and check. There, there's all my stuff. So, Let's see what have I been up to in the last five minutes. So there you go. And of course, this is not very exciting. You see on the right hand side, you see the latency statistics. So there's the, the front end latency for the clients um, to the log balancer to Nginx, from Nginx to the client itself, from Nginx to the upstream, and from the upstream to Nginx. And immediately you see, hey, that's cool. So for that, and that, you know, we're looking right now, we're looking at the, the component level. So a part of an application. So it could be a microservice, could be something. Um, that view is however also at the application level. So imagine if you had configured multiple URIs, multiple paths, if you had, you know, pure, total application consists of a number of paths that you are interested in seeing. This is the place where you would actually see that aggregated. So you get, you know, the ultimate detail based on your path, visibility on your application level. And likewise, you get that on your total environment. So if your application consisted of multiple log balance, so if you're able to aggregate all of that data and all of those views into, into your uh, statistics and your environment. And that's really nice. What's, what I, that's a feature that I like a lot. So we're here at the environment level, looking at all of my load balancers in my application. I can, you know, look back over the last five minutes 
And I could actually compare that to, provided I had the history, I can compare that to a baseline, well, ultimately go, going back maybe a year. So that you can compare what happened on Christmas last year with what I'm, ha what I'm seeing right now, coming up to Christmas. What can I expect? Assuming stuff hasn't changed, of course. But, you know, you see there's, there's nice granularity. But you can also break that out by, um, for instance, HTTP response code. So let's go and see if there's anything exciting here. So I see that there's 200s, there's 300s, there's 400s, 401s and 400s, 499. Hmm. That could be a sign of something interesting, actually. And similar, you can break that out by request outcome. So that's based on the um, advanced firewall that we're going to introduce very soon. The upstream response code. So if the backend server reports a specific error code and we mask it to the clients, then we are still able to drill down on that. <coughs> you can drill down by the particular upstream <coughs> or a country code. So you see that there's a, um, a good few ways to slice and dice <coughs> all the analytics on, in the environment. <coughs> Excuse me. So another simple one is just looking at load balancers. So what was the client, is there, you know, if, let's assume that, you know, you have a, a network latency issue with one of your load balancers. This one would be, would be the view that would tell it to you. Um, so you can also inspect load balancers on a, for the instances on a, on a more detailed level, but just going into the, um, into the overview where you get, you know, of all of your real estate, you get an application health score and a good view looking back on, you know, the last week, if that's something that that's needed. <coughs> if you wanted to see something on your infrastructure, and you go here, and this is where you get all of the metrics from your instance. So you can drill down on Nginx specific in, uh, um, parameters and just, you know, just monitor the device. What's, what's going on with it? What are the, what's the CPU usage, the load average, uh, all those kinds of things. And these, these allow, these are all the things that allow you to, you know, act on that. <coughs> Apologies. Um, so let me go and check if there's any, any questions. Um, so Martin, thank you. Um, so the question is, is there any integration of controller with big IP? Um, and what are the capabilities in long terms of monitoring of big IP or configuring big IP by controller? Um, so I can only give you an opinionate, opinionated answer on that. Um, and I hope that was, that was clear from the introduction that um, Nginx and F5 serve, you know, although we do, you know, the same stuff, i.e. I, we listen to requests and we, set, we load balance them as a full proxy onto backends and we ship that back. Nginx is typically seen very much in the, in the application side. And big IPs are very much seen in the, but more on in the data center side. Um, big IP, you can manage and orchestrate with, uh, with big IQ. Uh, but for the application side, a, a lot of stuff is, is missing. This is the, 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 the space that controller is moving in. So <clears throat> I don't, I have I haven't heard of of any reasons for to manage big IP by the Nginx controller. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any any roadmap that that suggests otherwise. Also, so hoping that that, that answers your question. Yeah. So Prometheus metrics, absolutely. Um, 
I see this mostly in the, in, in light of uh, Kubernetes. So if you use Nginx as the, uh, uh, and this goes both for Nginx open source and for um, Nginx plus, I've just configured a Prometheus uh, module. Uh, I think you have to set a couple of flags uh, to, to spin it up and make sure that it's up and running. Uh, uncomment you know, the scraper tags, and then from there on, you know, Prometheus, off you go. Works both for open source and for plus. So, <clears throat> in, in general, when it comes to metrics, um, I would say that it's, um, we typically fall back on, we do one thing and we do one thing well, and that is, you know, shipping packets from one end to the other. Everything else is secondary and we think is left best to our tools. So what we typically see is that we write the syslog and for instance, Logstash scrapes it and sends it off to Elastic. Um, Prometheus is, is slightly different beast in this case, but this, this is typically the pattern that we use. So Kafka, I would couple to syslog. Um, <clears throat> and on the other hand, Nginx gives you the tools um, to actually you know, massage the data a little bit more so that it's you know, easier parsable. You know, a good example would be that uh, you can set a, a flag on the, on the logging statements, so the logging configuration, so that you do JSON escaping. Uh, that is tremendously helpful, so you don't have to take care of that in your, in your expressions that you send over. Is, is that helpful? Um, <clears throat> are, there, are there any other particular parts of the, uh, of the controller that you would like to see or of Nginx Plus that I could uh, you know, discuss on um, that you would like to see? So <clears throat> if, there's, if there's no, oh, okay. Thanks, Martin. Um, so Philip, over to you. Okay, Antun, thank you very much. So um, I'm still inviting you to place any questions. Uh, we ended up uh, 40 minutes ahead. So we have still some time to answer your, your, any of your questions. So please don't hesitate. Okay, uh, Mario is asking, is there any support for F5 as a Kubernetes uh, load balancer? Um, Martin, do you want to, to answer that one? Yeah, I, I don't know, Mario, if the question is related like F5 being uh, deployed like uh, container inside Kubernetes <clears throat> for currently, currently not. Currently F5 Big IP uh, Tmos is placed either in virtual machine or in the hardware in front of Kubernetes as uh, ingress services. For load balancing like kube proxy inside Kubernetes, we are positioning Nginx currently. Okay, thank you, Martin. So any other questions? No questions coming, okay. So in that case, I think we can close, close today's webinar. So um, I'd like to um, uh, say big thanks to the speakers. So Osa, Martin, Antun, uh, a great job. And uh, to all attendees, uh, big thanks that you spent uh, one and a half hour with us. Um, 
the webinar uh, is being recorded, so you will get uh, the recording uh, in a couple of days. Uh, uh, and um, if you missed any of the parts, you can replay it. And if you have any further questions uh, about the content, please don't hesitate to uh, to contact us, and uh, we can have a one-to-one -one session with you. Um, so again, thank you very much and uh, uh, talk to you soon uh, in uh, one of the uh, future webinars. Thank you. Bye-bye.